it's my honor and privilege to stand here with you. Um, I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Alex Diaz, and I'm here under the authority of uh, an amazing group of leaders, pastors, and elders that have led this church for many years and continue to do so in a great way. So please help me thank them uh, for their leadership right now. And we're going to be going to Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. So raise your hand if you have a Bible. Raise your hand if you have a Bible. Raise your hand if you have a Bible. At the count of one, at the count of two, at the count of three. All right. Those of you who don't, we still love you. The words will be on the screen. It's okay. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Those of you who do have a Bible, while you go there, let me just reiterate. Next week, it's Easter. It's a great opportunity to invite people to church wherever you go. Uh, there are many Bible-believing churches here in Little Rock, um, and uh, Mosaic Church is one of them. So please make sure that you bring uh, a friend to church next week. We're going to be having an amazing experience beginning Good Friday, and it's going to be leading us through the idea of how to go from brokenness to breakthrough as we look at the death and sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. So it's going to be a great, great time. So please remember to bring a friend and to attend with us. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, and this is the triumphant entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. And it says this, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpash on the Mount of Olives. I hope that's how you pronounce that, by the way. Jesus sent two of them on ahead, and um, I'm sorry, I'm going to read it from here. He said, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Everybody say the word donkey, please. Thank you. I have a hard time pronouncing that because I'm one of them. Anyways. Lose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey. Everybody say donkey again. A colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clo clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the, road and, uh, on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The title of this message is Irrational Surrender. Everybody say irrational three times. Nobody said irrational three times. Those of us who are married understand the idea of vows. Raise your hand if you are happily married. And then the rest of you will see you later for some counseling. But <laughs> when you get married, you take these vows and basically you say, regardless of whatever is going to happen in the future, we're going to be married. Now, the reality is that most people pronounce those vows, but they don't live them out. Most people get married with conditions, with expectations. And when those conditions or expectations are not met or when they are broken, the marriage ends. In many cases, people enter a relationship saying, I will love you up until the moment when you get fat and ugly. I am so glad my wife didn't have that condition because she would have left me like 50 pounds ago. <laughs> this, this, was, this was a different body, you see. Um, she she would have married a good-looking, thin lawyer. And instead she married a chubby pastor. <laughs> but that wasn't one of her conditions. She said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marry you no matter what. Most people don't get married that way. And, that, and, and these conditions that we put into our marriages, we tend to put with our relationships, with our friends, with our jobs. If I don't get treated this way, if I don't get this kind of promotion, if I don't get this kind of income... And depending on whether those conditions are met or not, we break the relationship. Uh, how many of you know that we often do this with God? Especially when we begin to walk with him, when we begin to follow him, we put some conditions on him and we say, God, I am going to follow you. I am going to be a believer as long as you give me the income that I've been praying for or you give me the position that I've been working towards. Or you give me the relationship that I keep telling you to give me. Isn't that how we 
how we treat God sometimes. In fact, when I approach God on the throne, I have a list of conditions, a list of things that I need him to fulfill. And, and he doesn't even have to think because I've already done the thinking for him. And maybe I do this in my humanity to try and impress God, but the reality is God is not impressed by that because God loves us without conditions. Aren't you glad about that? That it doesn't matter where you are right now, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past day, the past week, the past year, or your whole life, there are no conditions for his love. That he loves you exactly where you are. And it's irrational. The love of God towards us is irrational. It's countercultural. It's not something that we know or understand innately in our humanity because we are taught by culture to love based on expectations, based on uh, conditions, based on commitment, based on a contract. But we're not taught to love in the way that God loves us, which is without conditions. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. A few years ago, I was reading an article on the success of many different CEOs that led their companies throughout the recession onto growth. And the one thing that the researchers said that these CEOs had in common is that they had something called irrational commitment. Everybody say irrational commitment. That they remain at the helm of the company trying to look for solutions even in the middle of a recession when it would have been better for them to sell their company or to merge with another company. And so I want to reappropriate that term and propose to you that for us as Christ followers, to be able to keep walking with God and see him at work in our lives, we need something beyond irrational commitment, which is we need an irrational surrender. It's what we're going to see Jesus doing over the next few, uh, the, the next few weeks as, as we study how he gave his life for us. It's what we're going to see in the disciples as they follow him. But it's not necessarily what we're going to see in everybody in the passage that we're reading today. You see, Matthew 21 shows us Jesus making an entrance into Jerusalem. How many of you like to make an entrance? I love to make an entrance. And whenever I make an entrance, I want it to be big and opulent. Because when I want to make an entrance, it's about fulfilling me and my desires. I want to have the best vehicle. I want to have the best clothing. I want to have the best of the best. And Jesus made this entrance in a much, much uh, more different way. As the Son of God, he made this entrance on an animal that would not be used for a king. You see, a king would have had a chariot with the best horses in the land. A king would have been surrounded by servants. A king would have been treated as such, whereas Jesus, as the king of kings, entered into the town of Jerusalem, riding on an animal that was lowly and humble. And we see reactions to this entrance that fulfilled a prophecy and we're going to be able to learn some things about a rational surrender from these actions today. Let's go back to verses 2 and 3. It says uh, that Jesus told his disciples, go into the village over there. And as, you, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. See, I think what we're finding here is a set of decisions that show us that irrational surrender yields control and it yields claim. Everybody say control and claim. These are the two things that we put upon the, the actions, decisions, and the resources that we have. We want to control every single step in our lives and we want to claim every resource that we have. Jesus made his disciples go and look for things that would have been irrational for people in this moment but they obeyed. He said, go and find a donkey and a colt and bring them to me. And the person will innately know that these are supposed to be for me. They are yielding control. They are taking a step towards something that may be irrational, but that had a purpose in the story of Jesus. And then when they go and take the colt, this colt and this, this uh, donkey are given as a way of yielding claim over those resources so that Jesus can have control. How many of you know that giving control to Jesus is hard? 
Giving control to Jesus is one of the hardest things to do because sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes we think that we know better what to do with our decisions and our resources, not understanding that what we see is just the material, it's just in the flesh. My wife gave me for Christmas a few years ago a gift certificate for one hour of flight instruction in a Cessna plane. Now, those of you who are pilots in the room, you will laugh at that, but for me it was a big deal because I've always wanted to be a pilot. In fact, I am the kind of passenger that if I'm in a plane, I'm already thinking of how the pilot should pilot that plane. And so I got my chance to finally pilot one, and I went into this little plane with this pilot, and he did all the, all the checking that you have to do of the plane around before you depart, and then we took off. And this happened in, the, in South Florida, in, uh, in the city of Fort Lauderdale, and so it was just a beautiful view as we flew around, and then at one point, the moment that I had been waiting for my whole life came. The pilot said, are you ready to take the helm? And I said, are you kidding me? Is the Pope Catholic? Yes, I'm ready. I took this helm, y'all. And maybe I thought that I was maverick. I don't know what was going on in my mind, but the first thing I did is I took a dip. Like that, and that plane went down into the ocean, and I could see the sharks just waiting for us. At that moment, I realized I had something in my hands that was controlling the plane, but I had lost all control. And this pilot took over. And as he took over, he actually had to tell me let go because I wanted the control even when he was driving it. Now, he was able to fly that plane and give me one of the most beautiful views ever of that beautiful peninsula and its keys, even as I was vomiting from the plane. It was one of the best moments of my life, and I, and I remember that moment so much because I think our Christian life is the same way, that he, uh, he, we may think that we can be in control and that we can do things that we want to do because we know the way they're supposed to be done and we know the story that needs to be written so that we can do the things that we want to do. And then the plane goes down. And if, you, if you've lived more than 10 years on this planet, you know that sometimes when you take control, the plane goes down and you lose momentum. You lose control of your story. But we have to understand that we have to yield control and claim to God of whatever is in our hands. That we have to lead and live with our hands open. That we have to realize that we are not in charge and that whatever is in our hands belongs to God. I have, a, I have a numerous family. My, my mother is one of 15 brothers and sisters. My father is one of nine. Neither one of my grandparents had cable until recently. These are, these are big, big Hispanic families. And getting them to go anywhere, they, they tend to travel as a group. And so my parents uh, would travel anywhere with my siblings. And one time they came to visit us to a city where we were living in, and I needed a, an SUV to pick all of them up so that we could all fit, including my wife and I, and a friend said, here, use my car. And it was a brand new car, and I thought, why would you give me something brand new to go pick up this, the, uh, my family? And he, I actually asked him, and he said, because it belongs to the Lord. This car is for the Lord, so whatever, you, whatever he needs it for, he can use it for. And right now, he wants me to give it to you so you can go pick up your family. And I said... In my mind, I wonder if the Lord can tell him that I need this car for at least two more years. <laughs> the Lord did not do that, but it was so cool to it was so cool to see somebody saying, What is mine is yours, because it doesn't belong to me. None of this belongs to me. That is irrational. See, I think these disciples are following irrational steps. I think the steps that Jesus is asking them to take at this moment, they're following it. But had I been one of the disciples, I would have thought, this is irrational, so I'm not going to do it. They decided to do it. They decided to go and find the resources that he asked them to find. And the person who gave those resources decided to give those resources and completely give away control in letting Jesus take over. See, many people think that at this moment, Jesus lost it. He lost control because it was leading towards his sacrifice. But the proposition this morning is that it's at this moment that he takes full control of the situation. And he knows where it's leading. Jesus takes full control. 
Some of us need to realize that we have to let him take control of our lives. In fact, some of us need to realize that whatever is coming our way, whatever situation is in front of us, if we let Jesus take control, we can see him at work. That when we let Jesus take over, we can see breakthrough. And for next week, we're going to be talking more about breakthrough. And I wanted just to give you a little bit of taste of that because it begins now. It begins in the moment when he takes control and the breakthrough begins. Let's continue on to verse 8. And this is one of the most aggravating verses in the whole Bible. It, it, it upsets me. And it says, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, and they spread them on the road. What is happening here? This is the kind of stuff that people at the time would do to honor a king or to, or to honor a, a, a savior, a messiah, a political leader. Is They would get in front of, uh, the, in front of the, the, their chariot, and they would put down plants and branches and clothing as a way of showing honor uh, to God. Now, it, it drives me a little bit insane because I know what happens next. Do you know what happens next? Raise your hand if you've seen the movie. I mean, we all, we've all seen the end of the movie, right? Is that these people who are laying down branches and clothing right now, uh, a few hours later, they actually begin to hide. And by the time that Jesus was crucified, there were only a handful of followers in the crowd and everybody else had run away. And so I look at this verse and I judge the crowd. I think, how dare they leave my Jesus alone? But isn't that how we live our lives, though? That, that, that sometimes we honor God, we, we bring him glory, and we praise him, and we lay down whatever he wants us to lay down when there is peace and prosperity. But then when there's obstacles, watch out. I would have honored God if he had given me that job. I would have honored God if he had given me that relationship, but he didn't, so I will retreat. I will take my branch, and I will put it away. I'm going to take that garment, and I'm going to put it away. And guess what? I am going to run. And this is where I want us to understand that the reaction from the crowd over the next few hours and days could have been different. That perhaps they needed to understand that their surrender and their, the glory they were giving to Jesus needed not to be conditional, but unconditional. And we're going to say it this way. Irrational surrender is unconditional. Everybody say unconditional. Because see, this was the, this was the easy part is giving glory to Jesus when the environment was prime. There was an open door for him to come into the city. There was a, an environment where following Jesus was fashionable. His name began to uh, become public. And, and following him uh, be, became almost a, a fashionable gathering. And even though he had faced some opposition, the crowds were growing because they knew that in Jesus they could find love, hope, healing. And so many people were following him because it was, it was the easy thing to do when they were receiving but what about two days later when there was nothing to receive other than a pause and a wait? When, when our conditions don't matter, when our expectations are not priority, when our story is incomplete, what happens then? What kind of surrender should we bring? In our flesh, in my blood, in my bones, I want to run in the other direction. But in the spirit, unconditional surrender can align you with the purposes of God and can be an environment for a blessing. The Bible says that. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter uh, 28, everybody say Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, just to make sure you're awake. In chapter 28, it tells the people of Israel how you are to live so that you can align yourselves with the purposes of God. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I invite you to do that at home. But it says in verse 13 and 14, the following, If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will always be on top and never at the bottom. You must not turn away from any of the commands I am giving you today. Or follow after other gods and 
worship them. For thousands of years, the people of God has known this word. That for us to be able to align ourselves with the purposes and the blessing of God, we have to follow his commandments. We have to irrationally and unconditionally surrender to what he wants us to do. It is not by way of earning salvation because Jesus paid for that salvation on the cross and came back on the third day and is alive today. So we receive that, but it's by way of us understanding growth and our sanctification. How does the favor of God show up? It shows up when we align ourselves with the purposes and the premises of the Lord. This is called living in a holy way, by the way. The Bible says... Uh, be holy like God is holy. In a sense, it's teaching us that this holiness, which is obedience of what he has asked us to do, ought to be unconditional. And that unconditional holiness can position us to receive favor from God. But we are in a fast gratification culture. I love my drive throughs and I judge people at the drive-thru if they take more than three minutes and I time them. Where's my cheeseburger? Because that is the way that this culture teaches me that I ought to receive things. Somebody said it like this. We are into microwavable blessings. And we need to understand that God crockpots them. When my wife puts a cro uh, some, some, uh, some, some ingredients in the crockpot... It makes me angry for about six hours <laughs> because it smells so good. Especially if it's overnight, I can't sleep. My stomach keeps me, it begins to churn. And I begin to, and I begin to just, you know, try and tame the flesh and make it my slave. You will not go down and take a bite of whatever is in the crock pot. And you know what I do? Instant gratification. I go and, and eat something from the pantry. Or if it's during the day, drive through and I get me a cheeseburger. But isn't what is in the crock pot much, much better for us than anything else? Yes, it always is for me. And the same thing happens with the blessings of God. That it's, he's not into fulfilling our instant gratification kind of culture or expectations, but that he wants us to align ourselves with his premises, with his purposes, so that we can create the environment where favor can take place. Because unconditional holiness positions us to receive favor. Unconditional holiness. Some of you are going to leave today and you're going to face a week fi uh, filled with opposition and opportunities to dishonor God in many ways. Repeat that to yourself, these two words, unconditional holiness. Some of you are going to have a hard week and you're going to miss out on, on, a, on a blessing. You're going, to, you're going to receive news of some broken expectations or your story will be broken in one way or another over the next few weeks and months and years. Repeat these two words to yourself. Unconditional holiness. Some of you are going to receive temptation that is going to threaten your marriages. In fact, some of you are going to receive it in a way that is easy to hide. Repeat this to yourselves. Unconditional holiness you got to protect your holiness and make it unconditional. See, these people, as they were worshiping Jesus, they were, worshiping, they were laying down branches with conditions. They were laying down these garments with conditions, with expectations that this man is going to free us from the, from the reign of the Roman Empire, and that was not his purpose. His purpose was a much greater kind of freedom, and they needed to understand that. Now, we keep reading in verse 9, that Jesus was at the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now that Hosanna is a combination of two ideas. is the, uh, the idea of people uh, calling out to God, save us. Save us. So it's a cry out for help. But it's two-sided because the other side of that same cry is a praise. It's a word of worship for Amaziah. 
And so the people who were yelling out, Hosanna, Hosanna, were saying, we praise you and we need you. We worship you and we're needing you to save us. And that's what we need to understand when we sing that song that we were singing just a few minutes ago, Hosanna in the highest. That is the same way that we need to be singing to him. But I learned something from the people who were singing this song because, first of all, a prophecy was being fulfilled. Right before their eyes, there was evidence that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who was fulfilling what God said he was going to do. It was happening right before their eyes. But there's something that we can learn about irrational surrender at this moment, is that that irrational surrender was public and praiseful. See, there is power in public declaration. Because public declaration unveils the work of God. In other words, when we pronounce who God is, when we pronounce what God is doing, when we pronounce who we know he is, we unveil to the world that he is at work. We reveal his work. We reveal his steps. We reveal his will to the rest of the world. But that public declaration needs to be accompanied by private worship. I believe this is part of the reason why this crowd had conditions is because it's easy to worship in public, but not in private. I wonder what would have happened if some of these people, now this is assumption, the Bible doesn't say this, I am just, in my opinion, saying I wonder what would have happened if they knew in their privacy what it was to unconditionally worship Jesus in a way that didn't affect them regardless of the persecution that was about to start. Because it's difficult to worship Jesus when we see a crucifixion coming. I know that's very difficult for me. In my life, I have a hard time worshiping or giving glory and praise to Jesus when the world seems to be against me. And then you know what I do in those moments? I get passive aggressive with God and then I sulk. I brood, I hide, I, I give up. There was a time when I was facing a great oppression and opposition onto the life and ministry of, of my wife and I, and that left me in between churches. This is, this is now inside baseball. This is what us pastors would call this is we, we were, we're in between churches in other words we're unemployed and I was unemployed and I was in between churches and I was at a Starbucks by myself just sulking and fighting with God and I was drinking my coffee but in my mind and in my heart I was being so passive aggressive with him saying well I guess you don't want to use me anymore if you don't want to use me anymore this is what I'm gonna do right here I'm just gonna sit and wait and you can go find yourself another Alex because we get that way with God. We get passive aggressive. And then this dude shows up from nowhere with a camera on his shoulder, a video camera. Turns out he was from a local TV station and he, he says to me, excuse me, are you religious in any way? <laughs> and I thought, do I look religious? I mean, I was in my pajamas. I had a cap on. I even had earrings at the time. I, I, I don't know. I was yelling screaming out of me that I was a person of faith but I said sure I I am religious I have a religion and he said we are doing this um, show on our TV station about heaven and we are conducting interviews on the streets to try and figure out what people think heaven is gonna look like and I need a Christian to tell us on camera what that looks like and I said He did not just ask me that. (laughs) He doesn't know I'm a preacher. I'm going to go long. And I got up, y'all, and I spoke for what seemed like an eternity. I got in front of that camera, and I said, Jesus, the Son of God, understanding the problem of humanity, gave payment for that which was death. And he died on the cross for us. And then on the third day, guess what? He came back to life. He defeated that death. And he makes that available to anyone. It's called salvation. But then there's more. Because after we've lived on this earth, we are allowed entrance into heaven 
unless he comes back for us and we will be in his presence forever. Now, the Bible doesn't say much about heaven, but what it does say, it's pretty amazing and it's almost unfathomable that the streets are made of gold and there's crystal everywhere and that the presence of God is so thick that there's no pain or sorrow or sickness, that there is no need for a sun to, to, uh, to set on the skies because the presence of God is so bright and so alive that he will be shining upon the whole city. I want to be a part of that city. And I got a chance to say that on TV and thousands of people saw it. And I just laughed at the humor of God because by giving me that opportunity, he was saying, I am going to use you with or without your expectations. I'm going to use you with or without your conditions. I'm going to use you no matter what. If you just give your life to me without conditions, without expectations, I will take your life, which is ordinary, and I'm going to turn it into an extraordinary life. For the glory of his name, for the name of Jesus. And that's what I want, church. And that's what this crowd had the opportunity to do. It, and most of them ran away. But at the moment, in their worship, they were saying, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Which to the crowd in the moment would have been heard as if someone was saying, This is Jesus from the silly little town of Nazareth. This is Jesus who is coming from an unlikely place, just like you and me. And you and me coming from unlikely places can now honor God and make this moment the moment of our decision when we say, yes, I will from this point on unconditionally follow him, unconditionally surrender to him, unconditionally yield control and claim of my life, unconditionally praise him and give him public and private worship, unconditionally let him take control of my life forever. And that's why we're going to respond together as a church and we're going to respond by remembering the moment when that took place, the moment when all of this is originated is at the moment of the cross, when Jesus gave his life for us. We get an opportunity to surrender unconditionally today and to follow him irrationally. Some of you are gonna face opposition, some of you are gonna face oppression, some of you are going to hear the world saying, you're a joke. You should not be following or obeying Jesus. But you will be repeating to yourselves, I follow him unconditionally and irrationally and counterculturally because Jesus is worthy of my praise during good times and bad times, in times of peace and in times of opposition. And I want to let him have control of my life. Amen. Please stand up and let's pray. Jesus, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to hear your words and, and heed them. Forgive us for when we don't do this because there are times when we follow him with, we'll follow you with conditions. There are times when if our expectations are broken, if our conditions are not met, we, we hide and we run away. But I pray, Father, this is the moment that we decide as a people of God that we're going to follow you unconditionally. And we remember you now in the sacrifice because that's the moment when this started. That's the moment when you began to give us this sacrifice and this forgiveness and this redemption and this resurrection, Jesus. It all begins at the cross. Thank you, Lord for giving us the opportunity to follow you forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.